and welcome to Christ Church's Leadership Podcast in the Wesleyan tradition. Today, our text, because it is Advent season and we're coming towards the celebration of the Incarnation, when God became flesh, when Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth, taking upon human flesh so that we who are humans could one day stand before a holy God and not and not be dismissed, but to be in the presence of an advocate, Jesus Christ, who will stand there on our behalf because he himself became sin who knew no sin and took upon himself the sins of the world. So you and I could, in fact, have not only access, but an eternal relationship with the Heavenly Father. So Isaiah speaks to that. Isn't that incredible? Hundreds and hundreds of years before the birth of the Christ child, Isaiah chapter 9 says in verses 6 through 9, there's a powerful narrative there, but he says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. He says that he is a wonderful counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Why did Isaiah give us such specificity? Why didn't Isaiah just say God has come to dwell among us? Why give such specificity? I believe because Isaiah wanted us to pay attention to these four important uh, titles to this Messiah, this Christ who would come. And I want to say Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas. And may you and I embrace the Christ of Christmas fully as Isaiah lays him before us, exposes his nature, exposes his qualities, And says to us, I believe, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, hey, if you're going to believe in this Christ, if you're going to follow this Christ, then may these very elements of Christ be yours as well. Inasmuch as you partner with the living God, you live into this relationship with the living God. So we start off with these, these titles, these, these descriptions of who this Jesus is. He's wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. Now, what does a good counselor do? A good counselor should be a truth teller. Without truth being told, you don't really have much of a counselor. If you have someone that you go to to receive counsel from, guidance, direction, maybe just to be a sounding board, and they just smile at you and nod their head. And you say, well, I'm, I'm getting ready to go 100 miles an hour and run into a brick wall. Well, that's good, honey, whatever makes you happy. Well, no, I'm, I'm really getting ready to blow up my life because I think I'm going to think I'm gonna start really exposing this other person here because I'm going to get even with them. Well, that's, that's wonderful, honey. You, you just go ahead and blow your life up, and, and I'll be here to to help you pick up the pieces after it's all an absolute disaster. No, if you and I have a counselor worth his or her salt, they're going to be a truth teller because they love you too much not to tell the truth. So I need to ask you a question. Do you have a truth teller in your life? Do you have somebody who's not always permission giving? You know, the best of parents will say every now and then, no, no. No, honey, no, 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 I'm sorry, you're not going out tonight. No, you're not going to have screen time for the rest of this week because you've abused some privileges. You've disrespected your mom or your dad. No, honey, I can't let you have more money to spend when you haven't been a good steward over the current allowance or the current uh, money that I have given you. Why would I give you more? if you haven't been a good steward over what I have given you. And so another question to ask on a much deeper level on a truth-telling 
uh, continuing in the truth-telling, wonderful counselor mode, is your sarcasm right now, is your contempt in the areas of your life, is it destroying your joy? Is it destroying your joy? I heard a wise commentator, a theologian slash counselor say this in the past week. Our culture today endorses a mindset to give you permission to tear down other people's buildings instead of challenging you to build your own. Our culture today (coughs) endorses a mindset to give you permission to tear down other people's buildings instead of challenging you to build your own. Folks, I, I, I don't have enough time anymore tearing down other people's buildings. Now, suffice it to say, I do get upset about world events. I get upset about certain things that are going on. I, I don't understand some things that are going on in the world. I don't understand recently how 39 prisoners could be released and you only get 13 hostages for that. I'm just saying, stuff like that frustrates me. I'm kind of of the Old Testament, New Testament, where a life for a life, you know, all lives are valuable. But I don't know everything that's going on behind the scenes. I don't know what it took to get to where they are. So instead of tearing the building down, I'm just going to be faithful over the vineyard that God's given me and reminds me the value of every human life. So when I see somebody on the street, instead of dismissing them because they don't wear a certain clothes, they don't look a certain way, they don't act a certain way, God helped me to put a 10 out of a scale of 1 to 10 on that person's forehead instead of automatically putting a 2 or a 3 because I have some bias against that person. See, I can't do much about world events and, and, and what's going on in the world. It frustrates me but I can do something about the world that I'm living in right now. So can I build the building that God's got me to build? In other words, can I build people up or am I going to spend time tearing people down? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking he's a wonderful counselor. I think he came to build stuff up and not tear it down. He was willing for his own life to be torn down, but not so that you and I could go around tearing people down. He was allowing, he said to the disciples, didn't he, and to the onlookers and the Pharisees overheard him, tear this building down, and I tell you, in three days, it will rise again. In other words, I'm going to allow my building, my life, to be broken so that you can be a restorer and a redeemer of life. So, folks, let's let's be absolutely um, and 110% against the culture. We don't want to be about tearing down other people through sarcasm and contempt. Let's do everything we can to be a kingdom builder as this wonderful counselor, this Jesus, came to be. And now, that doesn't mean we don't tell people the truth. So you tell people the truth, that's not tearing people down. If you do it out of love and you pray for God's redemptive work to be in place. I'm talking about the sarcasm and the contempt that knows that knows no bounds. It's not spoken out of love. It's spoken out of insecurity. It's spoken out of, of, of sometimes a vindictive spirit, uh, and it's 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 contemptuous. So that's what I'm talking about. Telling people the truth out of love is not in any way, shape, or form a desire to tear down. It's actually a desire to hopefully hold accountable and to correct, so the person can find redemption and hope. And new life. Mighty God, mighty God. I don't know about you, but but when I see uh, astrologers, uh, when I see uh, scientists, when I see people trying to uh, describe the expanse and vastness of our of our universe and, and our own galaxy, I, I'm amazed at, 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 the, at the mighty nature of God. But can I suggest to you that being mighty can be counterintuitive? Being mighty could be just the opposite of what the world thinks. How mighty is it to go to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5? Have this mind among yourselves, which you have in Christ Jesus, that he, though being found in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be held on to. So he emptied himself, taking the form of a human being. 
When Jesus came to planet Earth, he turned everything upside down. Children were property. Women were property. Children were to be used and abused at the father's or the government's discretion. Jesus put children on his lap, and he blessed them. Jesus elevated women and had many of them not only around him, but had many of them to bear witness of his power and his healing and even his resurrection. The first evangelist was Mary of Magdala that said, I have seen the risen Lord. Jesus elevated women and children in a way that no person has ever done. Jesus elevated humility as a virtue. Prior to that, it was only seen as a weakness. Floyd Schaefer came to Greensboro College when I was a freshman. And just one line sometimes can stick in your spiritual crawl. He said, the most powerful thing you'll ever do in the world is to give up your power. If you don't believe me, ask Jesus. The most powerful thing in the world you'll ever do is to give up your power. Now, at the very least, at the very least, folks, share power. At the very least, share responsibility. The only way to multiply your life, the only way to multiply ministry, the only way to multiply your impact in the world is to share, share ministry, share influence, share resources, share yourself with others. Churches that I see that are growing and will go the distance, they'll be around 30 and 50 plus years from now, they share their resources. They give them away for free. They share their staff members' time. They even ask the question in their evaluations, how much in the past year have you shared with other churches? Have you helped other churches be successful? That's a part of their accountability. Folks, you can't live like a kingdom church like that and not allow God, the Holy Spirit, to come in and bless that place. Because it's all about the King of kings and Lord of lords. It's all about God. It's all about God's kingdom. It's not about your kingdom. It's not about your advancement. You're trying to advance the kingdom of God when you live like that. That's totally counterintuitive to the world. The most powerful thing you can do is give up your power. At the very least, share it. Mighty God. And yet, he chose to make you and me in his image. He didn't have to. He was complete in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Trinity. But he chose to have a relationship with us. And when we messed up, he was willing to go to the nth degree. I told you it would be a Wesleyan podcast. John Wesley, one night I discovered this about 1 a.m. in my study at Centenary Methodist Church. I was preparing to write my dissertation for my thesis on Wesley and Wesley's understanding of eschatology, the coming of the end. And I remember reading this line, and it just, it just caused me to break down and weep. John Wesley said, It is indeed a sad reality that humanity has fallen and disobeyed God. However, humanity would never know the great depths that God would go. If it had not been for the fall, humanity would never know the great depths that God would go in order to reconcile us to himself. Tragic that the fall occurred, but without the fall, humanity would have never known the great depths that God would go to reconcile us to himself. And that's what he did. Everlasting Father. The Bible says uh, that God is a father to the fatherless and a husband to the widow. God can also heal and restore brokenness caused by human and earthly fatherlessness. God can heal and restore pain in our hearts and our lives when earthly fathers have abused their privilege and have hurt us verbally or hurt us physically. This everlasting father can be a father to us in ways that no human could ever be. In the deep recesses of our hearts, with all of our insecurities going around and running around within us, the presence of the everlasting Father can bring security, can bring a sense of substance, can bring a sense of hope. 
You see, I believe that's what happened. I believe God modeled that at Jesus' baptism. When Jesus came and humbled himself before the Father. Now, now think about it for a moment. We all know this, but I don't think we really spend much time on this. He submitted himself to baptism, but there was nothing to wash away. There was no sin to repent of. Jesus was sinless. But he was willing to be baptized because he would not ask you and me to do something that he himself was not willing to do. He submitted himself obediently unto the Father. And Jesus went down into the water and even John the Baptist knew there's, there was something, in, in one way, there was something not right about this, and another way, it was totally right. And that's why John the Baptist said, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, you need to baptize me. I'm not even worthy to untie uh, your, uh, the thongs or, uh, on your sandal. I, I'm not even worthy to, to wash your feet. And Jesus said, no, we must do this to fulfill all righteousness. Something in one respect was all wrong with this. He didn't need to be baptized. But there was something that was totally right about this because Jesus said righteousness had to be fulfilled. And because the Son, he was obedient to the Father and to the Father's will and to the Father's dream and plan of redeeming all of mankind, when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came and rested on his shoulder. But then the heavens opened up and the voice of the Heavenly Father said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There may be times in your life you feel like nobody's looking. Nobody knows in the dark corners and recesses of your life that you're being faithful. My wife Julie said years ago when our adult children were just babies. I mean, I think one was an infant and one a toddler and one barely out of, out of uh, diapers and in training pants. She was folding laundry at the bed and she was just feeling like Charles is at church. Here I am folding laundry. Nobody knows what I do. And I'll have to do it again tomorrow. She, she had a woman one time that was in her Bible study group, and Julie was just saying, I just feel so overwhelmed. There's so much laundry. And she says, honey, just do a load a day. Just do a load a day, and that's how you keep up. She said, I have four kids. I do three loads a day, and I still haven't caught up. The woman said, Oh, my. <laughs> Sometimes people who know don't really know. In any case, she was folding the laundry that day and feeling like what she does is so mundane. Nobody notices whatever. And she just felt the Holy Spirit. She felt the voice of the Father coming to her and saying, I see what you're doing. I know what you're doing. And I don't take it for granted. I see you. I notice you. You see, that's an everlasting father. He knows both our disobedience, but he also sees our faithfulness. He also sees the little things that we try to do each and every day for him. He is an everlasting father. And lastly, but really importantly, he's the Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Folks, I need to say this. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is not the absence of conflict. You see, in fact, I don't think you can have peace without confronting issues in a relationship, family, nonprofit, church, marriage, because this will rob you of your joy of fulfillment if you just let things go and don't confront, don't talk about issues. Don't, if you don't have necessary conversations, you cannot have peace. Peace is not the absence of conflict. In fact, it is trying to be proactive about conflict, conflict instead of what? Being reactive. And most of the time, when I have had the most pain and the most chaos in my life, in my relationships, in my marriage, is when I'm reactive to conflict instead of being proactive. Instead of saying, hey, can we talk about this? I, obviously, you're not happy with with, I can see it in your face. You're not happy with this. Can, can we talk? Can we have a conversation? So addressing, having, addressing conflict, having necessary conflicts, conversations about the conflict or about the disagreement or 
There's just a feeling of unsettledness, whatever it is. But having necessary conversations are essential if there's going to be peace in a home, in a church, or in a nonprofit, or in your marriage, for that matter. And now I want to bring you a Christmas commentary from John Wesley. I promised a Merry Christmas in the Wesleyan tradition. John Wesley in his notes on the New Testament, chapter 2 of Luke, verse 14. John Wesley says, For with the Redeemer's birth, peace and all kinds of happiness come down to dwell on earth. Yea, the overflowings of divine goodwill and favor are now exercised towards men. Something powerful happened when God left his home in heaven and descended down the back stairs of Bethlehem and laid in a manger so we who are human could find our way home to God. Merry Christmas. And may you and I ponder, plunder, and try to live out what it means to worship a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Thank you for joining us today.